morning, everyone. A few months ago, Peter Klein asked me to talk about how to handle the revise and resubmit process, the scientific process. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. Because I knew I would be totally jet lagged coming doing Tokyo, Copenhagen, Milano, and then Atlanta. Um, I am pretty jet lagged. <laughs> and also because I, I figured that, well, handling on us, where are the generalizable insights here? There probably aren't any. Any revise and resubmit, resubmit experience is unique, right? And then about a week ago, uh, I received a program where I figured, my name figured, and uh, <laughs> I realized that I've probably been too soft and European in my, my rejection of the, the opportunities to give, it, give a talk here today. So Peter put me on, perhaps he was just too thick-headed to understand it. <laughs> but anyway, we had a little discussion, and uh, Peter told me that Sharon would be very pleased if I show up this morning. So here I am. Thank it's you. all for you, Sharon. Thank you. And these, <laughs> these nice kids. <laughs> Sorry, Tom Scholars. Let's, let's kick off with a few preliminary observations about the revise and resubmission process and on us in general. The first thing to note is that getting a revise and resubmit invitation is a relatively uh, rare occurrence for the simple reason that most editorial decisions are reject decisions. On average, it's probably you know, aggregating across all relevant journals out there. We're probably talking about 85% decisions that are rejects. Okay, the rest are various kinds of revise and resubmit. Immediate acceptance, as we all know, is extremely rare. Of course, this is journal dependence, so the probability of re receiving a re revise and resubmit decision is journal dependent. So at AMR, it's probably in the neighborhood of 10% maximum. If it's the journal I invented, the Sardinian Journal of Effectual Entrepreneurship, or Creationism and Entrepreneurship, it's probably, you know, in the neighborhood of 90, 95%, I guess. So it's journal dependent. Which, of course, also implies a lesson about being strategic in your journal choice. Because that is going to influence the probability of receiving a revise and resubmit. Which is what we want. This is our immediate aim. We don't necessarily want an immediate acceptance. We'll never get it. And the paper is going to change a lot as a result of the revision anyway. So the immediate aim is to get a revise and resubmit decision from the editor. And this is good, and this is what we should aim for, because the probability of being finally accepted, of course, shoots up dramatically after you receive a revise and resubmit invitation from the editor. Uh, and of, but of course, what we want, ultimately, is to get the paper accepted. And this is where I thought there's very little generalizable that you can say. But think, there may be some things you can say, actually. Uh, some basic rules of thumb. Because, first of all, revise and resubmit decisions come in different forms. Uh, the editor may actually signal to you whether he or she likes the paper or not. This is often difficult. This is very ambiguous, difficult to figure out. Uh, you have to apply your judgment. There are clear do's and there are clear don'ts in dealing with reuse. Things you should do and things you absolutely should not do. So because we all want to get accepted because we want our ideas out and we want our careers, we want our pay and so on, uh, this, is a, this is a subject that is on the mind of many people. So when I try to Google, revise and resubmit for scientific journals, this is, this is unfortunately this is in Danish, but you can, perhaps you can see the number. It says 478,000 hits for, for this entry alone. So there's a lot of literature, a lot of stuff out there that you can consult. Well, I haven't really based. consulted. This is just based on my own armchair philosophizing over the last few days. This is something we care about, and this is also why there's so many um, war stories, or horror stories perhaps rather, are told about revise and resub resubmit processes. Uh, and this partially stems from the fact that top journals characteristically refuse to commit to a manuscript. It's not like the editor will tell you, I really like your manuscript, just do this and I'm going to accept it. Um, unless you're very, very close to final acceptance, that is conditional acceptance, right? But usually you'll get zero commitment of any kind from an editor. The editor will, on the contrary, t tell you, this goes for almost all journals now, that your revision is going to be high risk. 
to, to illustrate, one colleague went through six rounds of revision at the Academy of Management in Germany. He was up for tenure, so he was, as you can imagine, pretty desperate. So in the end, he, he wrote it. I seen the mail. It was very direct, actually. To, he wrote a mail to the editor, and to, telling the editor, please just make a decision. Reject me if you think that's best, but I need a decision now. And he got the, he got the decision, and it was actually a conditional acceptance. But six rounds, that's how, how much it can sometimes take. So does it matter? Yes, it matters a lot, because revising uh, your paper usually makes it better. It's not always the case. So here's another horror story. This is Brian Arthur, a famous economist who wrote an economics classic called Competing Technologies, Increasing Returns, and Login by Historical Event. Uh, and I put the paper, finally published in the Economic Journal, 1989, through eight re rewrites in this revision process alone. It had been rejected almost everywhere else, okay? Each time, it became stiffer, more formal, less informative, and as a result, more publishable. <laughs> so that's the cynical you. Luckily, it's not usually like that. You know, surveys have been done, and in fact, most authors find that reuse do help to improve the paper often quite substantially. But, 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 these surveys also reveal that many, many authors are unhappy that they are forced to drop really central points that they consider uh, important to, to, to the argument. You know, the, the phenomenon, if you like, of academic prostitution. You don't really want to do it, but you do it to gain a, an advantage. All right, so how do we, how do we handle our NAS in the best possible way? So I, I found this little figure on on Google Image, and it turned out to have seven steps, so I, I figured I'd better come up with seven steps. Here they are. So something semi-generalizable about, about how to handle the R&R &R process. And the first important thing is to, to understand the editorial decision letter. And these are, these are the types of letters that you'll see. And the, the first one is the, the most common one, the outright rejection one. And there's immediate acceptance. It probably never really really happens. But then the rest are various kinds of revise and resubmit decisions or letters, ranging from the reject and resubmit uh, decision. I reject your paper because I think something is fundamentally flawed, or these, I misassigned reviewers to it. I didn't pick the right reviewers. But if you rewrite the paper pretty dramatically, keep the theme, resubmit it, that's, that's, that is OK. Then there's the usual one, the non-committing invitation to strongly revise and resubmit. And then there's a revise and resubmit with only minor revisions needed. The editor will typically still tell you that it's high risk. And there's conditional acceptance, so that's pretty far into the process. And then there's, well, final acceptance, if you like. And of course, the nature of your revision task will depend on what kind of revise and resubmit decision you receive. So the reject and resubmit typically entails a total rewrite, uh, a revise and resubmit with minor re revisions needed only, well, requires minor revisions, okay? Another aspect of understanding the editorial letter is to try to understand the editor's intentions because you'll often signal her belief in your paper's potential. And one basic, very basic rule of thumb is it's a good signal if high-risk revision does not appear in the letter. They, it usually appears, but sometimes it, it does not. But in any case, <coughs> when you've received the editorial letter, this is also the stage where you need, need to make up your mind, is this revision worth doing at all? Because the editor may seem negative. The reviewers may call for truly dramatic changes. Uh, you, it's still high risk, highly uncertain whether you'll, you'll ultimately get to accept it. So perhaps it's better really to do a little bit and send the paper somewhere else. But decoding the editorial letter is, I think, of the essence. So what, what do you think this letter signals? You can read quickly through it. No, or if it's just technicality. So this is a paper that Jay Barney and I Submitted to the SNJ recently, and we got this letter. Is it a good, nice letter or a bad letter? It's a very nice letter. It's a very nice letter indeed. Why'd you say that? They didn't tell you that you need to do 20,000 more like, interviews or like, yeah. or something. Basically, minor revisions, isn't it? 
not all the detail about really minor technical points. There's some stuff about the motivation stuff and so on, but it's not really something that is seen as a deep problem at all. You need to massage the motivation. But this is a nice paper. No mention of high risk. No mention of high risk at all. So we're pretty confident that we'll get this paper through. Maybe subject to re review. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that was point one. Understand the editorial letter and what the editor tries to signal to you. Point two, understand what are the main critical points. And this, I say this because, particularly at the, at the very good journals, you get very long reviews. You may get four reviews each four pages. That's 16 pages in, in total. They're long. They go in all, di all sorts of directions. They make all sorts of suggestions, sometimes unreasonable, because you know the reviewers, they don't really have a priority right in your manuscript. It's a free lunch for them. They can say, in a sense, they can say, and sometimes will say anything, and make, make demands that are sometimes unreasonable. So uh, to help you understand what are the main critical points, good editors will often synthesize the reviewers' reports and highlight, highlight the main points. But even at good journals, editors don't really do this. For example, at Research Policy, which is a very good journal, I think, the editor doesn't really do this in the way that an editor of an academy journal would do it. So you're, you're left to your own devices, as it were. You need to identify the main critical points yourself. And this is, of course, important for the, for the obvious reasons that these are the points that you must concentrate on, in particular. And if you don't take seriously the main critical points, something like this may happen. <laughs> it truly is poisonous, isn't it? <laughs> so this is how this is sorry goes way back. Twenty actually twenty years. Twenty years this year, yes. So I, I uh, teamed up with uh, an American senior scholar, extremely respected in his field, and we Wrote, wrote a paper on the history and content of capabilities theory in economics and management. And we sent the first draft to the Journal of Economic Literature, which is a highly ranked economics journal. Very highly ranked, in fact. Sort of very generalist. And, uh, but it, it would be extremely good for both Dick, Dick, Dick Langlois and myself to get that paper placed. And the editor, uh, I'll not bore you with his name, but he, he truly liked the first draft that we sent, the first submission. Uh, and felt there was a need in that journal for this kind of paper, but he told us this is not, this is not, mind you, a, the People's Journal or People's Magazine of Economics. Your manuscript is way too pe people-centric. So you drop names, Penrose said this, Richardson said this, Marshall said this. So it's organized around people. This is not the way we do it. This was his main point. Please heed my advice, which we did not. And we got projected. Really sucked because you know, getting this, landing this paper at that state of my career would have been really great. So pay attention to those points that the editor tells you are the main points that you must address. All right, under the connected to this, um, there's another problem, namely that reuse may be non-convergent, uh, and the editor does not really comment on this which is a, a very common problem. There's a whole Facebook page dedicated to this. It's called, uh, what's, what's the name of it? Reuer 2 must be stopped. Reuer 2 must be stopped, exactly. With hilarious, Reuer 2 is of course the non-convergent, idiosyncratic, annoying Reuer, right? Who we don't want to please, so it should be stopped. So if you go to this Facebook page, there'll be, there are lots of horror stories there. Very amusing. But if you, if you have non-convergent reuse, which also happens quite often, you have a problem because, of course, then you have to make a, a, a crucial decision about in which direction the, the revision should go. Sometimes the, the editor may indicate, not too strongly indicate, which reuse she sides with, but often she, the editor does not. So what can you do? You can write the editor and ask for a clarification. You can do it, but it's a risky strategy because it also signals weakness. I mean, this, this, is a, this is an author who doesn't really know how to handle this problem, okay? I'm not really going to help. By the way, well, besides, editors are extremely busy and overcommitted and so on, like the rest of us. So chances are you, you, won't get, you won't get help. 
Uh, but this is the problem. So my first submission to the SMJ with a Danish colleague uh, suffered from this problem. Um, so one, one reviewer liked the paper a lot, but only wrote half a page, and the report was very lame. Clearly, he or she hadn't really read the paper. The other reviewer was much less impressed. You may also get these kind of, of letters. It'll, and let me tell you, it'll take you a couple of days to recover from, from these, kind of, <laughs> these kind of reports. Clearly, a non-convergent non reuse, leading ultimately to rejection. But also, you know, this was an 11 pages review report, so it really helped us to revise the paper and publish it somewhere else. OK, third, third item, set up the response documents. And you probably all, all know this. I mean, you, what, the way you do it is you, you copy paste the reuse comments in a, in a numbered sequence with your responses following each reuse comment. Sometimes I see people uh, reorganizing the, the reuse comments. So if, if to the two or three reuse said the same thing they treated in, in, in one block, as it were. I, I don't think you should do this. It doesn't really work. Uh, just do it the mechanical way, copy and paste, and then just address the comments seriatim. Uh, my recommendation is to do this before the actual process of revising the paper itself. Why? Well, because it allows you and your co-authors, and most papers are, of course, today written in teams, it allows you to reach agreement on what are the main or what are the peripheral points before you actually uh, revise the paper itself and how the, these points should be dealt with. So it gives you a master plan for the actual revision. And of course, of course, you know, you'll, you'll have to go back and revisit your response document and rewrite that also. Uh, for some, I think it works to set up, uh, for example, an Excel file with, with columns. So th this is, these are the reviewers. This is the suggestions or comments proffered by this reviewer. This is how I, I think I should respond to it. And then you can have a, a final fourth column where you said, is this done? Have I addressed the comments satisfactorily? Uh, and this, I, this could work. Uh, some people like that approach, and could ease working with co-authors on responses. But of course, again, you know, you cannot submit an Excel file to, to a journal. You'll have to put it into, a, say, a doc form, format at the end. Uh, this was the fourth item, diplomacy, tact, and, but also confidence. Reviewers may be dumb. Of course they are. They, they hated your manuscript, or at least one of them did. <laughs> so, uh, but. The serious point here is that many reviewers spend very little time on your manuscript. One of my first early professional shocks uh, was walking back from a conference with a very, 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 very big guy in strategy. I won't give you the name. Uh, but this guy told me, I'm, 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 I'll go to my hotel room and I'll, I'll review three manuscripts for top journals, A plus journals, SMJ, AMJ, MR. So, wow, that's going to take the rest of the after this afternoon. No, no way, he said. Only an hour, one hour. And he was serious. He was totally serious. And although you may have spent six, seven, eight, nine months working on your manuscript, chances are you'll get a reviewer who will only spend an hour on your manuscript. I mean, a person will read the title, the abstract, the introduction, the conclusion, and look at the hypotheses and write up a report based on that reading. It's unfortunately, surprisingly common. I mean, you can tell when you see the report, right? Uh, so th that is, of course, incredibly frustrating because you put so much time and effort into it. But you know, it's not a good idea to flag your opinion of the reviewer's IQ or, or work effort. It's not a good idea. I mean, you want, your goal is to make all the reviewers like your manuscript in the end. And why? Well, not to please them per se. I mean, you couldn't care less in a sense about them, right? But because reviewers, no, editors want anonymity. They want the reviewers to agree that this is a this is a manuscript that you editor should publish. So you need to to some to some uh, degree you need to please them. So tell them that you're grateful for the work you did. They did, uh, but don't do it in the slime, slimy, non-credible way that I very often see. Don't start every response with "Thanks for this great comment." No, that's, it, 
it's just done, right? It may be enough to thank them in the beginning, have a little paragraph. You know, Thanks for your many well-taken comments, which greatly helped to improve this paper, and in particular in the following di um, directions, blah, blah, blah. And then thank them in, again at the end of, of responding to their comments. You don't have to do everything the reviewers want you to do. You're not a slave of the reviewers, of course. But if you diverge from what they propose, you need to explain why you do. Why is it that you cannot take their advice, uh, in a sense, seriously? And if you think they are wrong, which of course they often are, you, you need to explain politely why you think they're wrong and why you have chosen a different way to address the, the particular problem that they highlight. All right, final, uh, no, fifth, that three more actually, fifth point, comprehensiveness. Um, this is related to the point about uh, responding to thoughtfully to each point. So some comments are more important than other ones, but again, you must respond to each and every comment. Don't play games, don't delete some comments because you think you cannot really respond to them because reviewers will find out, okay? Don't copy in the text in the manuscript that you changed. It makes it extremely cumbersome to read through the uh, response document if you're a reviewer. Explain instead briefly what, what exactly you did. Uh, but in any case, this kind of comprehensiveness means that good response documents are typically long. They're often half the length of the paper itself. So if this is a typical 40 pages paper submission, you'll, you'll often have a response document which is 20 pages. Point six, timing and planning. So many, many journals, I think all the academy journals do, will give you a deadline, typically two months. You've got two months to do the revision. Others don't stipulate that deadline. I don't think strategic management journals stipulate any deadlines, or at least, uh, if they do, they're very fine to the future. We're talking about years here. Most journals ask for extensions because two months may be too little. Uh, but again, asking for multiple extensions is, of course, a bad signal. And ultimately, the editor will lose patience with you. So timing and planning, because you're under time pressure, timing and planning <coughs> are important. And I think that, that you know, bad planning is the, the main cause of ultimately successful revisions. People just didn't have the time to do a good revision. Of course, um, People are also different in their psychologies. There are people like me who really want to start on the revision the day after I have received a revised and resubmission uh, mail. Then there are people like Peter Klein who prefer to do the revisions the last 24 hours before the deadline. And he, he thrives on that. He, that's the way he works. And you can imagine uh, that when Peter and I do papers, we've done many papers together that can uh, sometimes, you know, coordination issues may arise. <laughs> Final point, take necessary care. Uh, <coughs> double check your response document and the revised manuscript to, but first of all, to make sure that you actually have, re have satisfactorily addressed all the points and that there's some kind of congruence between what is in the manuscript and what is in the response document. It's extremely important to do a final readover of the manuscript. Uh, so sort of make sure, guarantee that, you know, the the, the, the important points that trigger, that trigger the interest of the reviewers are still there. That it's still appealing. That there's still a good flow, even after you've made all those revisions. Because some, sometimes when you revise, you may end up with a manuscript that's pretty cluttered and going in different, dif different directions. And you don't want that. Okay? You, want the, you want them to truly like that final version of your manuscript. So you need to engage a little bit of, to use a German phrase, verstehen. Imagine a reader who is not, not a reviewer, just any reader, any academic reader, who's unaware of the original article or the letter from the reviewers uh, as your intended audience. Would this manuscript make sense to this, to this imaginary reader? So that's my, that's my final point, I think. Nothing about entrepreneurship at all, but I think everything I, 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 I've said generalizes to entrepreneurship journeys. But you tell me. Yeah, I think so too. Right.